Morning. Good morning, Booker Till. Welcome back to Partial Perspectives for today. As uh, Talia just mentioned, raise your hand if you're not a BRS member. I'm going to do that. I'm going there. Raise your hand. Member, Non-members of BRS. Members of BRS, you do your part for BRS, and we're so grateful for your support. If you're not a member of BRS and you've not contributed yet, then how could you benefit and enjoy and not do your part? So we invite you, we welcome you, and we want you, and we need your partnership. So as you're listening, whether you're live and in person or you're watching online live or later, take out your phone right now and go to brsonline.org slash global, brsonline.org slash global, and do your part. A modest contribution, a more meaningful contribution, whatever you spend on a dinner or a membership elsewhere to fill your car with gas, if you get minimally that benefit from our community, what you watch, what you listen to, what you read, what you value, we simply ask you to do your part. We're 15% towards our goal. We need to make it towards our goal. We need to complete our goal to continue to provide what we do. Tell you others will be outside of you here in person. So please stop and pause and do your part or simply go online, brsonline.org slash global. And I'm sorry to take our time to do this. I wish I didn't have to, but we need your support and your partnership. And frankly, respectfully, respectfully, if you benefit, if you're enriched, if you enjoy, it's the least that you can do. Please give, please give generously. We thank you. And the sooner that you do and we reach our goal, the less that you'll have to hear me talk about it. Our partial share is generously sponsored by Becky and Avi Katz and family in memory of David Grossman, Lila Nishmas, David Ben Menachem Manush. This morning, she is sponsored by Sarah Margulies in memory of her husband, our good friend Israel Margulies. Israel Margulies, Ben Yosef Mayer, and Esther, and in memory of Esti Masko, Esther Tilabaska, Revilo Pinchas. Also sponsored by the Geller and Alter families, Lila Nishmas Howard Geller, Chaim David Ben Yehuda Leib, on his ninth year site on the ninth of Adar. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Thank you to our members and our global members who enable and support all of the wonderful Torah learning. Parshas Tetzava, page 464, in the Art Scroll Stone Chumash. Viata Tetzavez B'nei Yisrael V'yichui Lach Hashem and Zai Zach Kasis Lamaor La'alos Ner Tamid. We continue. We've pivoted the second of the book of Shmos. It's the story of the Mishkan, the building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the design and the materials and the function of the kalim of the utensils that are found therein. Viata and you, Tetzavez B'nei Yisrael, Moshe is told to command the Jewish people, the Lacha, and take Shemen Zayis Zach, take clear olive oil. Who's the you? The Ata and you. Who's the you? Who is being spoken to here? Moshe. And we don't use his name. Balturim and others quote that this parsha does not have Moshe's name in it. Not necessarily inaccurate. The only parsha in the Torah doesn't have Moshe's name herein. Today is Zion Adar the anniversary of Moshe's death, also the anniversary of Moshe's birth. Zion Adar, Chaver Kadisha will mark tonight, our Chaver Kadisha, our incredible Chaver Kadisha, marks the annual Chaver Kadisha dinner on Moshe Rabbeinu's birthday and death. Hashem himself was the Chaver Kadisha. Hashem did the Tahara on Moshe. Chaver had off that day, and therefore it's the day of the Chaver Kadisha, Zion Adar dinner. The Atat Tzaveh, not a coincidence, Zion Adar is always the Parsha that doesn't have Moshe's name in it, Moshe's great humility. We've shared in the past the insight of the great Lubavitcher Rebbe Zatzal that Moshe does appear in the parsha. He appears even in a higher form than he ordinarily does. Normally, Moshe is limited or contained by his name, Moshe. But here, he's actually referenced at a higher level, not contained by his name, an even higher level as Viata and you. And you sounds rude. You. You sounds rude, right? To not use someone's name. We see it as a greater act or expression of affection to use someone's name. It's a very powerful thing. Next time you're checking out at Publix and you bother to see the name of the person checking you out and you thank them. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, Beryl. Whoever's checking you out, you will see them light up. They're a person. They're not an invisible, anonymous individual. They're a person when you use a name. We think a name is an act of expression. And we think of, hey, you, as rude. Right? You ask people who are newlyweds what they're calling their in-laws. Some struggle to say mom or dad or mommy or abba or adopt the name of calling their in-laws, so they call them you until they have a child and they can call them Bubby or Zadi or Saba or Safta. Psh, now they can exhale, now it's easy, now they can just call them that. But they say you, but you is rude. But the Baba Chairman said, no, Viata is a higher level. A name is limited. A name is a boundary. A name tries to capture us under that description, but you is the essence. So this Pasha is actually revealing and reflecting Moshe's essence 
And we're not going to go into it because we've spoken about it in years past. That's what Mordechai is telling Esther too. The at, ubeis avich tovedu, the at, you will lose your essence, your mission, why you're here. Esther, your name will go down. You're one of the king's wives. You'll be recalled in the books of Persia as one of the queens of Persia, the name Esther. But the viat, the who you are, your essence, your personal mission, why you're here, if you neglect this opportunity, if you don't take advantage, this is why you're here, then you will lose your essence. You will violate your very mission. So this parasha that Rebbe said, viata, is actually an elevated expression of Moshe's essence, his mission, not limited by the name. We've spoken about that in the past, but I want to begin with an insight of a friend of the Rebbe, Rav Soloveitchik, a classmate, Rav Soloveitchik, who writes, Parsha's Tetzava is the only Parsha, excluding those in Sefer Bracious, in which Moshe's name is not mentioned. Moshe is referred to only in the second person singular, you. Then the Gon states that the Parsha Tetzava does not contain Moshe's name, because this is the Parsha most often read during the week of, of Zion Adar, the day of Moshe's death. The conceptual link between the Parsha and his date seems obscure. Right? That status, stat, or that fact, we all know, Zion Adar dinners around the world tonight, Someone will mention Tetzaveh, Moshe's name doesn't appear, Zayin Adar, the day of his death. Okay, what's the connection? It's cute. But what's that about? What's the panemius? What's the deeper meaning or significance of that? So listen to what the Rav says. Very, very profound. It is in Parsha's Tetzaveh that Moshe was informed he was not to be the Kohen Gadol. Despite being the most obvious choice of the position, Moshe was the Redeemer. He saved Israel from annihilation during the Golden Calf Incident. Moshe had the strongest claim to this position. And yet, here, he was informed of the loss through these words. Right? Just two psukim later. Now, bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and with his sons from among the children of Israel, Aaron, Nadav, and Aviyu, Elazar, and Isamar, sons of Aaron, they are going to be the Kohanim meaning they and not you. Moshe, I know you thought you were the chief candidate. You were the leading candidate. The polls show that you were way ahead. I know you thought that you had it. However, you need to know it's not you. It's not you. Hakre ve'elacha. You need to bring close to you and you're going to coronate with oil. Who's going to serve? Aaron and his four sons. At this point, still four sons. Maybe he had more. What's a plus a Torah? Maybe we'll get to. But these four sons, it's in our Parsha, not deep, very beginning of our Parsha, that Moshe finds out that that great position of distinction, not honor, because Moshe is the most humble of all men, but distinction, to be the Kohen Gadol, to serve, to do the Avod of Yom Kippur, to have that position of distinction. Kohen Gadol, it's not going to you, Moshe. It's going to your brother. It's going to your brother Aaron. Moshe lost his right to assume the priesthood. Why? Why did it go to Aaron, not him? He's the Redeemer. He's the one who achieves atonement and forgiveness. as the Chita Egel. Moshe is the logical choice. So why doesn't it go to him? He loses that as a result of a conversation between Hashem and Moshe back in Pasha Shmos, in Perak Dalad, Pasuk Aleph. Moshe initially refused to accept the mission that God, had assumed, that God had insisted he assume to confront Paro and free the nation. Moshe argued that he could not lead the people. Why? Because he was a stutterer. To which Hashem replied, he would help him articulate during his confrontation with Paro. Hashem recruits Moshe, and what does Moshe say? I'm not so eloquent, I'm not so articulate, it's not really for me, I'm shy, I don't like the speaking part, thank you, but no thank you. Moshe demurs, he hesitates, he pushes away Hashem. Despite this assurance, Hashem says, I got your back, I'll put the words in your mouth, Aaron will do the speaking, but I'm telling you, you're the man. I've asked you. And despite that assurance, Moshe once again refused, asking Hashem to send someone else. Torah then tells us that Vayichar Af, Hashem got angry against Moshe. And he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levi? I know he'll surely speak. And Rashi asks, Go back to Perak Dalad, Pasuk Yudalad. Dalad Yudalad. What's the Pasuk? He says, what about your brother? You think that you have an out because you're not going to speak well, but what about your brother? 
Your brother could do you speaking. You know, your brother, the Aaron, the Levi. Why was it necessary to, again, tell Moshe, your brother, the Levi? Aaron, Moshe didn't know that his brother Aaron was a Levi? He's his brother. They're both from the tribe of Levi. Pretty clear to Moshe that Aaron is also a Levi. So Rashi quotes the Gemara in Zvachim. Yeshua ben Karchi, Karcha said, every expression of anger written in the Torah uses the term Charon Af. Here, however, we do not find a punishment for Moshe. Even though the expression of the anger that Hashem expressed on Moshe repeated refused was Vayichar Af. Rabbi Yossi answered, here too there is a punishment. The word Levi was inserted here. Aaron was destined to be a Levi, while Moshe was to be the Kohen. But now Aaron will be the Kohen, and Moshe will be the Levi. There is an allusion in the Torah to the fact that Hashem replaced. Aaron was going to be the Levi, you were going to be the Kohen, but I tried to recruit you over and over, and you refused your mission. You pushed away your mission, and because of that, you lost the kahuna. This parsha says Rav Salavechik marks a major turning point in Moshe's life. Had Moshe become the Kohen Gadol, Beis Amikdash would have never been destroyed. Had Moshe not initially refused his leadership role, the Exodus would have constituted a permanent, not temporary redemption. This parsha alludes to a dislocation in Jewish history. Moshe's name is not mentioned, for he could only give instructions to Aaron, but the avoda would be done only by Aaron. The parsha, which does not contain Moshe's name, coincides with Zion Adar, because in a sense, this parsha marks the beginning of Moshe's death. It's a very powerful image. We're about to read a lot more. We're only on Sefer Shmos, but Yikra Midbar Dvarim yet wait for us. And yet, this is a turning point. Moshe not becoming the Kohen and being satisfied being a Levi, which means he wasn't going to play the role he could have and should have played in life. And he wasn't going to create the condition of a permanent base on Mikdash and a permanent Geula. It is the beginning of his death. The Egyptian redemption did not result in the permanent redemption of the Jewish people. Moshe died prior to entering the land. And that's why the Parsha in which Moshe's name does not appear is the same week of, of Moshe's death because this Parsha is the beginning of his death. Or put differently, to make it a Parsha perspective for today for all of us, Put differently, every one of us has a unique mission and purpose in this world. And when we fail to fulfill it, when we run away from it, when we try to say, Hashem, let someone else do it. Someone else can lead or be the chair of that committee or initiate that project or play that role or donate to the global campaign of the Boca Raton Synagogue. Let someone else do it. When we run away from our mission, it is the beginning of our demise. It is the beginning of our death. We're here for a reason, a purpose. Why are we here? What difference are we meant to make? What is our purpose and mission in the world? Why did we wake up this morning? Why does Hashem have a lot of faith in us? When we accept it and we run with it and we try to fulfill it, we're never more alive. And when we run away from it, the story of Yonah trying to run away from his mission, but it chases him and it chases all of us. When we try to run away from it, or when we fail to fulfill it, it is the beginning of our death. And that is the connection, that is the insight at the beginning of our parsha. Perach of Ches, Pasuk Yud So the Kohanim and their vestments, Why the Big Day Kohuna? L'chavor u sifaras. They're there for kavod and sifaras, glory and splendor, which I would think would be the antithesis of the Mishkan. The Mishkan is a dwelling place for God. It should be all about simplicity, humility, why is it ornate, splendor, ostentatious? How do those reconcile? Speak to Chol Chachmei Lev, Hashem Elei Sibiru Chachma Biasu, Big Day Aaron Lekotcho Lechan Oli. And what is the purpose? Lekotcho, sanctify them, Lechan Oli. So which is it? Is it Lechavar Lesefaras? Is it for glory and splendor? Is it a fashion statement to draw attention and honor? Or is it Lechan Oli? Seems like a contradiction. Why do you have to be a chachmei lev? Why do you have to be so discerning and wise of heart? You have to be a good tailor. You have to be a good seamstress. You have to be a good fashion designer. Why do you have to be chacham lev? We're not answering any of these questions, but I want you to think about all of them. Eila begadim. So now we get to list what they are. Choshen efo ne'il ksonas tashbet mitznefes avnet and make them l'chahan oli. To serve me, skip to pasuk yudbeis. Perch of Ches Pasuk Yudbeis. 
The Samte Shnei Avanim Akisvos Aifod placed the stones on the shoulder straps of the Aifod. Why? Avnei Zikaron Levnei Yisrael. Aaron will carry the names before Hashem on both of his shoulders as a remembrance. The names of the Jewish people, the 12 Shvatim, appeared in two places, on the shoulder straps and also on the Choshen, on the breastplate. They're on the Aphod and on the Choshen. So we start. The Nasa Aaron, he carries their names. He carries their names. So Rav Chezka Levenstein, he wonders. The Pasuk says, what's the purpose of them? Avnei Zikaron Levnei Yisrael. Place both stones on the shoulder straps of the Aphod, remembrance stones for the Jewish people. The same thing is said later on our parsha, Pasuk Chavtes. You skip ahead, where it says, "V'nasa Aaron Shmos Bnei Yisrael B'Choshen Hamishpat Alibo B'Vo Al Hakodesh." Why does he have these stones? Lizikaron for whom? Lefnei Hashem Tamid. So the stones are on the shoulder straps for him to remember, and they're on the they're on the ephod, they're on the Choshen rather, the breastplate for who to remember? Lizikaron Lefnei Hashem. Why do you have to remember something? Because you are likely to forget. Memory is the opposite of forgetfulness. Remember is the opposite, the antonym for forget. Is forgetting shaykh to Hashem? The Almighty doesn't forget. He's omnipotent and infinite and perfect. He's all-knowing. He doesn't forget. He doesn't have senior moments. He's older than all of us. And he doesn't ever forget. So what do you mean, Zikaron Lefnei Hashem? Why does he have to remember? Says Rabbi Cheskel, Ba'achoshem ba'ifo l'lamed et b'nei Yisrael shiyim adu memais Hashem izbarach. V'yasu tamed pu'ulos miyuchadaz l'zikaron. We have to emulate and imitate Hashem and do things that will remind us. L'hazkir lehem afilos advar ma'burim shelo yishtachachu mehem. Memory is not only the opposite of forgetfulness. Memory is emphasis and focus. Memory, we invoke memory, not when we're worried we're going to forget, but when we want to draw attention and focus. Even the Almighty before whom there is no forgetfulness, we arrange the stones and we invoke all the Shvatim, the children of Hashem, to remind Him we're here, we're your children, don't forget us and love us. He can't forget us. But we want him to focus on us. That's why we daven three times a day. Hashem doesn't forget we're here, or He knows our needs better than we do. But we invoke his memory, we remind him we're here because we want him to focus. That's a way of creating a connection and a bond. The opening two words of Yisker, Yisker, the Yisker tefillah that people say when they've lost a loved one. What are the opening two words of Yisker? Yisker, Elohim. We think of Yisker as for us to remember. We like the Yisker candle. We remember and we remind ourselves of our loved ones who are not here. Yisker will be said on Pesach, and then again on Shavuos, and then Yom Kippur, and on Sukkot, four times a year. But Yizkor is not about people remembering their loved ones. The first two words of Yizkor are Yizkor Elohim. Because we're not only invoking our memory, we're trying to bring attention and invoke a connection to Hashem. So just like we're asking Hashem to focus, even on that which He couldn't forget, we need to do the same. The most important things in the world that we know the most sometimes the easiest to neglect and forget. And we need to create reminders. We need to create rituals and stimuli that are reminders to focus on that which is most important. Now in our davening, when we want to earn merit or invoke merit, whom do we mention? Elokei, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And yet, here on the Ephod, here on the Choshen, we have the 12 Shvatim. Not Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Why? How come our davening doesn't begin with the 12 Shvatim? And how come the Choshen doesn't include the Avos? I'll add that to the questions for you to think about that I'm not going to answer. The robe of the Aphod, 
the bottom of the robe of the ephod. Me'il ha'ephod klil t'cheilas. Make the robe of the ephod entirely out of turquoise wool. Kipi rosh besocho, the head opening folded over, otherwise known as a hem. Safa ye'i lafiv saviv ma'ase oreg, kifi tachra ye'i lo, lo yikareya. Over the border all around the weaver's work, like an opening of a coat of mail, so it can't be torn. Why do we have a hem around the edge of an article of clothing? So it doesn't easily tear. So it doesn't easily tear. And make on its hem pomegranates of turquoise, purple and scarlet wool, on its hem all around. And pa'amone zahav, top of page 472. Pa'amone zahav, golden bells between them, the socham saviv. All around and between them, golden, golden bells. Golden bells. So, the Gemara in Erechen tells us about these bells. The me'il is machaper alashon hara. Each of the garments in the Mishkan atoned for another mistake that we make, another poor judgment that we show. The different garments in the Mishkan would atone for the mistakes that Klai Yisrael make. What did the me'il atone for? The coin wore the me'il under the ephod. What did it atone for? The Gemara Erech and Daft Tazayin says, me'il machaper alashon hara. The me'il atones for gossip. Abuse of the power of speech. Omar Kadish Baruchu, Yavo Dover She the Kol, the Yachapar al Maisa Kol. The bells when the Kohen would walk with a garment with bells on the bottom. It would make a noise, it would ring. So let the thing that produces a sound atone for the people who produce the wrong sounds. You raise your voice, you get angry, you speak Lashanar and gossip. You use our voice, we use our voices the wrong way, let the meal with its voice. With the bells that ring, let it atone. A bell was found several years ago. I've mentioned the Parsha class. They've now excavated, by the way, all the way from Ir David. You can now walk up all the way to under the Kota Plaza. You can go all the way the same path that our ancestors walked at the time of the Beis HaMikdash when they would make their way up. You can now walk all the way up. It's unbelievable, the excavations. It's extraordinary. And in those excavations, they found one of these bells. They found one of these bells. Pa'amonim, rimonim. They found them. Chavetz Chaim wonders. Es hakol shav b'il yishmiu ha'pa'amonim l'shem ma'hiu rimonim she'ena mashvim kol kol. Velo esber ma'inyanim. We know that there were alternating bells. Some had the center of the bell. What's that called? Inbal? Oh. Oh. Lerom. Inbal. Some have the bell and others were empty. Others were just, what's that called? The bell. Others were just the bell without the inbal. So if the coal of the sound that was produced is what created the kapara, the atonement, why did we have bells without the ringer? Excuse me if I call it the ringer. So the gemara, the clapper? Gemara and chulin, getting a whole education here. Ma um naso shal adam ba'olam azayasim atzmo ki'ilem yochal af b'divrei Torah kein tamad lomar tzedek tadabrun tafket adibu ilum otor v'kashen yochal daber I love lasim atzmo ki'ilem. The power of speech is to know when to speak and when to be silent. It's not always what to say. It's not replacing the wrong thing to say with the right thing to say. It's knowing sometimes the virtue of silence. Zem ha'shenir maz b'rimonim shaliyara pa'amonim l'sirugin shala adam she'ino lo me'i Torah me'ezo siba shilishtok v'az kashiru misnaheg ba'ofen zeh when you know how to be silent, you're speaking volumes. So alternating were bells with clappers and bells that were empty so that we would learn the lesson. What is machaper on the oven of Dibur is not only saying the wrong things, replacing it with the right things, but saying the right things and also knowing when to not say anything at all. It's a tremendous power and a virtue in silence. There's no value to always speaking. There's no value to always speaking. Mishnova says, we learn more from when we're quiet than when we speak. We're given two ears and one mouth. There is a virtue and a value to silence. Revolba says, when a child learns to speak, he gets so excited, we clap. They said their first word. They said their first sentence. We're so excited, they start speaking. But we never teach them how to stop. We don't say, you stop talking, yay! 
you get in a lot of trouble if you try to do that. You put them in therapy, it'll be very expensive, they'll write a book, they'll accuse you of all kinds of terrible things. So we celebrate when they start speaking, but Revolba says we don't acknowledge or celebrate when we learn the art of silence to stop speaking. But silence is also an art and a virtue. It's also an art and a virtue. Rav Tzitz Pesach Frank, not Rav Tzitz Pesach Frank, his son-in-law, the Menachem Tzion, Rav Menachem Tzion Zaks, he writes, there was a holy Jew who lived in Yerushalayim, known as Hashaskin, he was the quiet one. He was the quiet one. So someone once asked him, how is it you stay quiet? And he said, the truth is, it's exhausting. When I'm too tired, I speak. But when I have the energy, I'm able to remain silent. It's the opposite of what you think, right? It takes energy to speak, it's easier to be quiet. It takes more energy to show self-restraint and to be silent. He said, when I'm tired and I have no self-control, then I speak. So the alternating bells with the ringer and without are to remind us that there's a time to speak, it's a time to speak and a time to be quiet. A base level is the time to be quiet. Terribly, tragically, not with bad intention or malice, but sometimes it's a perfect example. You feel the pain, such empathy for another. You're so desperate to say something, but there's nothing to say. So when Trump tries to speak in a situation where there's nothing to say, often they say something foolish or even hurtful. And silence is much louder. Eov's friends sat with him in silence. That's why the Shulchan Aruch says when you go to a Shiva home, it's a halacha and a Shiva call. You're not allowed to speak until until the Oval speaks. Because if the Oval wants to sit in silence, that's your job. Ah, it's awkward. Ah, it's uncomfortable. Too bad. My colleague and friend, Rabbi Eddie Davis, talks about he was once in England and he needed a haircut. He went to a barber. And when he sat in the barber's chair, he wrote this in an article in Jewish Action. He sat in the barber's chair and the barber, as he put the robe or bib around him, he said, talk or no talk? which is a very nice thing to offer. You wish the dentist would say similarly. Talk? <laughs> talk or no talk? In other words, do you want to sit here in silence or do you want me to start a conversation with you? Talk or no talk? And that's what happens. You walk into a base avel and essentially what we say with our silence is talk or no talk. It's up to you. Ah, but I'm prepared. I'm ready to sit in silence because there's a virtue, there's a value, there's a nobility. We have to learn to not only celebrate when we speak, but to celebrate when we're silent, and that is what is going on over here, says the Chavetz Chaim as well. As well, the Ramban points out. Next pasuk. This meil was worn by Aaron when he came to do the service of the avoda, and v'nishma kolo b'vo'o al hakodesh l'tnei Hashem u'v'tzeisav v'lo yamos. The bells would produce a sound when he entered. And when he left, when he entered, and when he left, lechayra, ain nanamas akavat shadam gadol yelech and begadon sheish bam pamonim shemitzatzel them bechol psios mpsiosav. What was the purpose of these garments? Torah told us, lechavod el sefaras, to bring honor and dignity. So I ask you, is there a more undignified garment than something with bells that rings on while you walk? It's like a purim. Wardrobe, perm costume. It's ridiculous. Is there anything more undignified? Is there anything more lacking honor than wearing something that is bells that makes a sound every time you take a step? Where's the covenant of Tefaris in it? So the Ramban, not here on this Pasuk later, Pasuk Mem Gimel, the Ramban writes the following. The reason for the Bells is so that Aaron would be heard when he entered and he wouldn't die. The Ramban here connects our parsha with Purim. Esther, it's not her turn. She's not invited. She's not given entrance. She has to wait for what? The Shavit Hazahav. One of her hesitations, she says to Mordechai, it's not my turn. If I go and I'm not invited, he's going to have off with my head. And that's when Mordechai has to persuade her with the argument. 
Mi odeim la iska zosi gat la machus. She says, I'm going to go anyway. He extends the shavit hazahav. She's welcome to come in. She makes her plea, come to the party, and later for the Jewish people. But you're not allowed to enter royalty. You can't enter the inner chamber of the king without an invitation, without permission. How does the Kohen do that? The bells are his announcement that he's coming. That's his permission to enter, the license to go in. That's the Ramban. So one does the say for the Sitcha Elyon, Yesh les bonen, har inyan zanir alanu inyan shal derech eretz, pe'emes lo shach itzlak al shboruch metziyesh at zrichin lo di alo she'om dim likanes. Now does that make sense to you? The Almighty God is found in the holy sanctuary. He knows you're at the door. He doesn't need a ring doorbell. He doesn't need to see the video that you're outside. He doesn't need to check and go on the ring doorbell. He knows exactly who's outside. He knows someone's waiting. He knows someone's about to come in. You need bells to be the doorbell to enter, to announce you're coming in. So you see here a lesson of Derech Eretz. It's not Derech Eretz. You don't enter without knocking. But it's a death penalty? I don't know, we get capital punishment? Death penalty for coming in without knocking? So Yitachain, Shein kavan asar amban bashvah lamelech, Shetzarech lekaba rishus, El avana shein knisa lahecha lahecha lo beli rishus, Ki malcha zehan haga shona legamre, Zuchumra gedola shah knisa beli pa'amonim, Ki avodas hakohen lefnei kashem izbor chayevus liyos biyira gedola batsuma, Uvahavana ma shosem im chalila ein avana zu, V'nechnasem kach, Beli hoda achana hareza bizayon chamor. The Gemara Baba Basra says, A person shouldn't enter their house without knocking on the door. The Gemara there tells us not only the door of someone else, but the door of your own home. Not only when you know there are people inside, even if the house is empty. Why? Who are you going to startle? The lizard? The iguana who's taken up residence in your house? Who are you going to startle? The answer is, it's a hanhaga of derech eretz. It is simply an act of courtesy. It's a proper behavior. You knock before you open a door. It's just the proper behavior. It's the way that you come in. It's the way you go into your parents' home, your in-laws' home, the way they come into your home, the way you go into your own home, and the way you go into even your home when no one's there. It's an act of derech eretz. You knock and you enter. It's the way that you come in. But he's wondering, v'lo yamas? And if you didn't do that, if you felt comfortable and casual, if it's your own home, if you know one, no one's there, you're not given the death penalty. So why would Aaron have been given the death penalty if he came in without the rimonim ringing. He says, because where Aaron was going is not the same thing as entering your home or the home of another. Where was Aaron entering? A holy place. You cannot enter a holy place without stopping and pausing and acknowledging and announcing where you're about to enter. Before you walk into shul, before you walk into the base medrash, you need to stop and think and pause and contemplate what you're about to do. Those rimonim are ringing not just to alert Hashem, they're ringing to alert Aaron. I'm not just going into any other ordinary place. I'm about to go into a very sacred space, a very holy place, and I need to check myself. Is my mind where I need it to be? Am I bringing the attitude that I need to bring, and we too need to learn from here, he says, Viloyamas, so sacred, so high are the stakes, that when we enter a sacred space, don't just be walking in on your phone, don't be walking in in conversation, don't be walking in in laughter and, and frivolity, walk in with seriousness and sobriety, pause at the entrance of the Beis Medrash or of the Shul of the Mikdash Ma'at, think about where you're about to enter and what you're about to do, and get your head, get your mind, in the right place, in the right place. Vinishma kolo. Purpose of this is so that the sound can be heard. Our first Otsa Plosa Torah for the day. The Rishonim wonder, we just saw several interpretations. Why? Why do the Rimonim need to produce a sound? Other garments are there to keep you warm, to keep you dry, to keep you modest. Protect you from the elements or from embarrassment, but 
these don't have that function. So why were they there? The gam ain't there a chanech badim litlos pa'amonim v'rimonim b'big dayem. Kings and royalty. Nobody walks down the red carpet with bells on the bottom of their garment. El atziv Hashem lasos kein sh'ahidei sh'nish makola pa'amonim v'rimonim. Have a ki'ilu sh'ol v'notel rishus li'kanes ki haba be'echel ha'melech p'tom chayv misa. Like we saw with Achashverosh. Kol avdei ha'melech v'amidinos ha'melech yodim. Asher kol ish v'isha sh'ahivu ha'melech al'achatzer p'nimim sh'ol ikra achas so it's not that we're copying Achashverosh, it's that Achashverosh was copying the king, king of kings. It's not only when you enter, but it's also when you exit. You're going out with the permission of the king. And you're also announcing to the king's servants, our meeting is done, you can go back in. I would add, humbly, that if you apply what we just saw in the Lasit Ha'elyon, that the same way before Aaron entered, an alarm would go off, the bell would ring, do you know where you're about to go, is your mind in the right place? That bell needed to also ring before he left. Why did the bell need to ring before he left? You could say maybe to distinguish, to make Havdalah between the significance and sacredness of where he was and the mundane he was about to re-enter. But I would argue something else. Maybe the bell needed to ring again to remind him to take what he had experienced inside and to bring it and inform and inspire what he's about to do. That you don't leave holiness in the temple, but you bring it to the space, to everywhere you're about to go. So the bell needs to ring, and now if you apply it to today, we need to pause and consider and focus our minds, not only when we're walking in to remember where we're going, but also pause and think about what we're doing on our way out. And here, we're not going to develop it right now. We did Shabbat Shuvah 2006. Aleinu l'shabeach. Aleinu is always the end of davening. Why is Aleinu at the end of davening? And Aleinu is a din in the end of davening. So for example, at the end of Mincha and Yom Kippur, if you're about to recite Ni'ila immediately after, you don't say Aleinu. You don't say Aleinu. You go from Mincha into Ni'ila. Musaf, you don't say Aleinu. We should say Aleinu. The Rav said we should say Aleinu. Why? We have a break. We take a long break. So Aleinu. Aleinu always escorts you out of davening. The Sakain Olam B'Machus Shakai. Aleinu is what escorts us out of davening. It escorts us out of davening. Many years ago, at Pelkutz, Zechron Lavracha spoke here in our shul, and he said, you always find those words, the Sakein Olam. He says, you know, you know the joke? The Jews on the Federation mission to Israel, and they asked the Israeli tour guard, how do you say Tikkun Olam in Hebrew? <laughs> Tikkun Olam sounds like it's just a cat phrase, a slogan of the Jewish people. Everything's Tikkun Olam, social justice, that's what we have to do. Tikkun Olam, Tikkun Olam, Tikkun Olam. But Pelkutz pointed out, we never find the word tikkun olam in the Torah or Tanakh on its own. It's the sakein olam, the machus shakai. It's not tikkun olam, some humanistic social justice, what feels good. You have to mold and shape and repair the world. How? In God's image. It's what God wants. It's God's blueprint. It's God's instruction manual. Those words have to always go together. But aleinu is the mission statement, not for how to come into shul, how to take what you just experienced in shul and bring it with you everywhere you go. It's a big question. When do you say Le David? After Aleinu, before Aleinu? Where does the Kaddish go? Hare Kedem is a whole, a whole uh, Rav Shurkin has from the Rav. But Aleinu is always the end of davening because Aleinu is the mission statement, the charge, how to leave davening where you go. And maybe that's the word here. The bell would ring, not only on the way in to remind you where we're about to enter, but the bell rings on the way out when you're crossing the threshold of Shul. When you're crossing that threshold and you're about, you're done learning, and you're about to go where you're going, you need to stop and pause and say, how am I bringing what I just experienced in davening or in learning to where I'm going? How will that animate and inform and inspire me at the gym or the supermarket or in the operating room or the boardroom or the courtroom? Wherever I'm going, I have to pause. It has to ring in my ears where I'm going. But anyway, back to the, that's an original thought. I don't know if it's right, but it's original. Otsar Plos HaTorah. Back to Otsar Plos HaTorah. gives another reason. Kidei Shalo Yifko Bo Malachi Elokim. 
Machmas kenasa me godel malas a kohen godel. But lachain tziv sa Torah litim pa amonim veri monim mishulim meil. Kedei lashmiya kolo bavo la kodesh. Kilo machris la malacham she yatsu misham. Kedei she yuchal a kohen godel avush la malach la avras a malach be yichud. Because the kohen godel is entering and he's telling the angels, out. I'm about to experience private time with the King of Kings. Out. Get lost. Go somewhere else. If you'll excuse us for some time, we're about to be alone. You know when we recreate this? Ni'ila. Shlomo Kabach says, we, our image of Ni'ila are, the gates are closing. The gates are going to be locked quickly. I know you're tired. I know you're thirsty. I know your breath is terrible. But get it together. Because this is the last chance. The gates are closing. They're going to get locked. Sneak in that last tefillah. This is it. Shlomo says that's all wrong. You want to know what Ni'ila is? You're going into a private space with Hashem and you're locking the door behind you. Ni'ilah, until now we were all together. But now the Amid of Ni'ilah, I'm going into a sacred space, the Kodesh HaKadoshim, and I'm locking the door. And that's the Pa'amonim Ramonim that are ringing, are saying to everyone else, if you'll excuse us, the Yichud room. We just celebrated a chuppah. There were a thousand people at the chuppah and it was streamed online to a thousand more. And there was a drone flying right over the chuppah that was getting the aerial view of the whole chuppah. The whole world saw the chuppah. Chassan and Kala came together and they did so in front of the entire world for the whole world to see. And now they go into Yichud. Nine minutes to be alone, to experience what it means to be a husband and wife, and to celebrate and market without the whole world watching. To be alone, said Rav Shlomo, Ni'ila is not that the doors are locking quickly, get in your tefillah, that you're going into the Kodesh HaKadoshim and lock the door behind you. So the Pa'amonim Varimonim say Rishonim are Aaron Akoin, the Me'il announcing, Angels, if you'll excuse us, I'm about to have some Yichud with Hashem. Intimacy and affection. This is my Yichud room to be alone with the Ribbon Shalom. I want to tell you another outstanding insight. So possibly we just read, V'nishma kolo, the sound will be heard, the voice will be heard. Bivo'o el HaKodesh, when Aaron goes in, Nufnei Hashem, so, when he goes in and when he goes out. Balaturim on this Pasuk. Zog the Balaturim. Cites a Mesora. That the word Vinishma, I alluded to this earlier in the Amunashir, the word Vinishma appears three times in Tanakh. Who here knows Tanakh? You don't know Tanakh. You all grew up Orthodox, so you don't know Tanakh. The word Vinishma appears three times in Tanakh. And the other two are Nasa Vinishma, Harsinai, and so one is here, Vinishma Kolo, one is Harsinai Nasa Vinishma. And what's the third? I'll give you a hint. We're going to read it twice next week. Megillah Esther. Where does it appear in Megillah Esther? Perak Aleph Pasachaf. V'nishma piskam hamelach asher yaaseh b'chol machuso. And the word of the king, which he will enact, will be heard in all of his kingdom. So Zog the Balaturim, the word v'nishma is, is three times in Tanakh. Nasa v'nishma, v'nishma kolo, in the Megillah. The decree of Achashverosh. We know that the word Hamelech, the word Hamelech, we spoke about this in Living with Amuna this morning. You could listen later, audio or video. And after you do, take a moment to give to the global campaign to express your gratitude. Did I mention the global campaign? BRSonline.org slash global. I don't see any of you take out your phones. Probably because you're just going to stop after at Talia and take care of it there. But please do. So we mentioned the word king, Melech, appears in the Megillah and it invariably alludes to the king, to Hashem, the word king. The Balaturim offers a fascinating connection between these three. The word Nishma appears in three places. It appears in reference to the king in the Megillah. The king in the Megillah is always Hashem. What's the connection? What's going on? What's going on? Look at the Balaturim, but I want to share with you a different insight from the Gera Rosh Hashiva of Sheol Alter Shlita. He says the following. He says a Yid, a Jew, could easily mistakenly believe or conclude that a Jew is too distant from Hashem to be heard. You know who Hashem listens to? Tzadikim and Tzidkaniyos, righteous men and women. He listens to the holy among us, the holy and the righteous, the people who are vigilant and scrupulous in halacha, in Torah and in mitzvos, who daven with fervor. Me? A pathetic failure. I forget to make brachas. I daven without kavana. I'm not so careful with this. My amun is shaky. I'm so distant and I'm so far. I'm so disobedient that maybe Hashem never hears me. 
He doesn't listen to me. Hashem only hears the righteous. He only hears the righteous. Says of Shaul Alter, the word Nishma is only said three times in Tanakh. What do they have in common? Nishma es kolo nasa v'nishma. Nishma es pisgama melech. To teach us, like our Nakoin, when he enters the Holy of Holy, his voice will be heard. Hashem hears all of us. You're never too far, you're never too distant. The Pasuk in Esther counters that thought. Because what does it say? V'nishma pisgama melech asher yaseh where? V'chol malchuso. Hashem hears, V'nishma Piskama Melech, where? Every person, in every place, no matter how close or no matter how far, no matter how much you've wandered, no matter how distant you are, no matter how low or far you've fallen, no matter how much you've stumbled, in all the kingdom, B'chol Malchuso, you're still in the kingdom of Hashem. As long as you live under the Malchus of Hashem, as long as you believe and you want to talk to Him, as long as you want to confide or surrender to Him, as long as you want to lean on Him and feel His embrace and hear Him talking to you, Vinishma He'll hear wherever you are. Every Jew is connected to that source of holiness which Hashem has placed in this world. So just as our Nakoin was heard, just as in our parasha Vinishma Kolo, Aaron's heard, so too Vinishma Bechol Malchuso, we're heard. Why is that? How is that? And what merit is that? Because of Nasa Vinishma. When we said Nasa Vinishma, in that moment, we secured our position, our approach. In that merit, wherever we are, however far we've fallen, we can be heard by Him. So don't ever say, why? I once met with somebody, grew up, very stark, very firm, grew up Hasidish, and he had fallen very far, he was off the derach. And he had a challenge, he had an issue with the law. And he had been out on parole, and he was coming for a big trial, coming before a judge. He went and met with me the day before, and he told me, you know what his issue was? He said, I know I need to dive into Hashem, the real king, the real judge, to get a good outcome tomorrow. But why would he want to hear from me? Do you know how long it's been since I've spoken to him? Do you know how long it's been since I asked him for anything, thanked him for anything, even argued with him on anything? He hasn't heard from me in forever. I'm so far away from him. So why would he want to hear from me now? And why would he listen to me and help me? So Rabbi, I don't know what to do. Because tomorrow's a big day. He could, be, he could have been thrown in jail the next day. Tomorrow the judge could throw me in jail. I could lose my freedom. I know that Hashem will decide, but I don't know how to talk to him. Do you know what I said to him? I said, he was a young man. Not married, no children. I said, you don't know this. We spoke about this in the Amunashir today too. When you have children, you'll learn that there's nothing they can do which would make you not want to ever hear from them. It could be forever since you've last heard from them. Then just don't put money on their debit card. And then you'll hear from them quickly. But it could be forever since you last heard from them. They could have disappointed you enormously. But when they reach out, you'll be so happy they did. No matter where you are or what you're doing, you'll take that call. And you will gladly, gladly receive that conversation. So go talk to Hashem and start out the conversation and say, Hashem, I know it's been a long time. I know you haven't heard from me in a while. I'm sorry for that. But I want to talk to you now because I need you. And if a child said that to a parent, is there a parent who wouldn't hear? When we say that to Avinu Shabbat he more than hears. So says the Hele Gager Rosh Hashiva of Shal Alter, that, that's maybe the Pshat in the Balaturim. Three times Nishma appears in Tanakh. Nishma, Nasa and Nishma, first. Nishma Kolo, Aaron. And Nishma Bechol Malchusto. Piskama Melach, Megillah Sester. Why? Because it's not just when you're on the level of Aaron Akoin. Your Nishma is Bechol Malchusto. Wherever we are, however we're behaving, however far we've fallen, He will hear us. Why? As long as we're Bechinas Nasa and Nishma. If we're living with the Nasa Venishma, with that attitude, with that approach, with that commitment, Hashem will still hear us. Another one of the Begadim, the Big Day Kahuna. What, what is the uh, on Aaron's forehead? 
We're talking here about the tzitz. The tzitz was placed on Aaron's forehead. It said, what did it say on it? Kodesh Lashem. On one line or two lines? Machlokas. Gemara records the Machlokas. Kodesh Lashem. Was it written on one line or two lines? And then the Gemara says one of the great rabbis, Tanaim, uses a checkmate. You know what he says? It appears several places in the Gemara, in Shas. He says, you think you know? I know. You know why I know? Because I went to Rome, and in Rome is the tzitz, and I saw it. And here's what it says on it. And that's one of our sources of evidence that our holy utensils are sitting in the basement of the Vatican. Not the Aron. The Aron is buried underneath the Harabais. But the other utensils are still there, and they're ours. We deserve them. You know what? Because it's printed on the Arch of Titus. He celebrated having brought them there. But we also have evidence that we have Tanaim quoted in the Gemara who say, I saw it with my own eyes. So don't pontificate, don't conjecture. I can tell you empirically, I saw it, and this is what it says. Kodesh Lashem, Kodesh Lashem. So where did it sit? On the forehead. It sat on the forehead of Aaron. Forgiveness for a sin of regarding the sacred offerings of the children of, of Israel. Regarding the offerings. So here's an amazing thing. Ramban writes, Dabar Pella, Santa Metznefes Al Rosho. Sorry, I skipped. Amitz Kotamid. First, Amitz Kotamid. Before we go back to the Yotzer Plosa Torah. Yeah. Gemara Yuma Dav Zayin says the following. I'm about Rabba Barav Huna. Chayv Adam Lamash Mesh Betfilin, the Chosha, the Shah Kabachomer Mitzitz. Matzit Shein Boela, Askara Achas, Kodesh Lashem, Omra Torah Vaya Mitz Kotamid. The Gemara Yuma says that a Jew who wears tefillin for an extended period of time he needs to every now and then touch the tefillin and remember he's wearing them. You can't have a heschadas. You can't ever forget. You have to maintain the mindfulness that you're wearing tefillin. How do you know that? Because the, the tzitz, which said Kodesh Hashem, had Hashem's name one time, and yet it had to be Amitzcho Tamid. You had to remember consistently. So the tefillin, which Hashem's name appears many times, Allah has kama v'kama. Now we don't wear tefillin all day today. We only wear tefillin during davening. When I say we, I don't mean everybody. I have a nephew who learns in Yerushalayim, in Zilberman. In Zilberman they wear tefillin all day. My nephew wears tefillin while he's eating, while he's driving, while he's walking. Wherever he goes, they wear tefillin all day. Wear tefillin all day. And in fact, he's got pretty compelling evidence that they're doing the right thing, we're doing the wrong thing. Why that is, why we don't, why the minig for most is not to wear tefillin all day, a topic for another time. But the minig of Zilberman is to wear tefillin all day. If you're walking in Yerushalayim, you see Jews walking through with tefillin on, and it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon, there's a good chance they're learning in the old city, they're learning at, at Zilberman. So if you wear tefillin all day, every now and then, you got to touch them, you got to remember mindfulness for them, because Hashem's name appears many times, and we learn that from the tzitz, where Hashem's name appears only one time, and yet... You couldn't have a Hesa Chadas. Zakhtar Isaac Sher, Rosh Hashim of Slabodka. You see from here a big chinach. What's the big chinach? He says, mindfulness, mindfulness. Maisam Shadam Osa Bizboninus, the Kochem the Romim Osa the Godless Nizgava. The Kamala Adam Leos Mushar, Etzem Afsharas and Ifla, Shakash Borcha Manik Lois Dam Nios, Kora Bos, the Romim is Kotz Musov. Kosh Borcha invites us to roll the day if we will be mindful, if we live a mindful life. Mindfulness is not some new age, Eastern religion, supermarket checkout aisle, magazine cover topic. Mindfulness wasn't discovered in the 21st century. Judaism is the ultimate platform of mindfulness. It's one of the books I wrote. The problem is so far I've only written it in my head. But I wrote a whole book about the Jewish approach to mindfulness and Judaism as the original platform of mindfulness. Mindful eating, mindful sleeping, mindful speaking, mindful listening, mindful dressing, mindful behaving. Every part of Jewish life is a platform for how to live mindfully. What goes in our mouth, out of our mouth, what order we tie our shoes in the morning, everything. Everything. It's an amazing book. It's a bestseller. It just hasn't been written yet. So far, it's only written in my mind. So, Rav Isaac Sher here says that Kodesh Baruch Hu invites us throughout the day and all of Torah and mitzvahs, all of halacha, is an invitation to be mindful. Does anyone else have a rule, any other religion, what order you put your pants on? put your right shoe on, then your left shoe, you tie the left shoe, then the right shoe. Why? Now there are deep reasons, chesed and din, there, there are deep reasons for it. 
There definitely are deep reasons. But even without the reasons, you know what it does? From the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you fall asleep at night, you are being trained and cultivated and conditioned towards mindfulness. Don't arbitrarily get dressed. Don't get dressed while being distracted. Be focused and be mindful in what you do because a meaningful life is a mindful life. And if you're not mindful, you cannot be living meaningfully. Mindlessness is meaninglessness. If you're going to live a meaningful life, it has to be a mindful life. And that's what Chazal were saying here. When you put your tefillin on, you're in a higher level than the Kohen Gadol wearing the tzitz. Because the Kohen Gadol with the tzitz, Hashem's name appeared once, and yet he had to be mindful. And every Jew who puts on tefillin, Hashem's name appears many times, so much so that the Gemara derives a kalvachomer for the focus and mindfulness you need to have. So when we put on tefillin, whether it's once in the morning or for an extended period of time, it is an exercise in mindfulness and the opportunity to live that mindful life, which is the secret and the answer to life. What does the tzitz atone for? What does it repair for? It's machaper and ozaz panim, an arrogance, an arrogance. Rav Nachman has a whole beautiful piece, which we don't have time for. Arrogance, what is the worst behavior that results from arrogance? Kaas, anger, rage. How is the tzitz? Mechaper for anger, for rage. We'll have to leave for another time, but we don't have time for it. But I wanted to bring your attention. We don't have time for anything else left that I have. But I'll at least draw your attention to something fascinating. Perch of Tes Pasuk Vav. Next, Perch of Tes Pasuk Vav. <coughs> we have the Mitznefes. The Samta Mitznefes Al Rosho. The turban. Minasatas Nezer HaKodesh Al Mitznefes. In Israel today, you won't find men wearing a mitznefet, but you'll find women. It's a, it's a uh, fashion, it's fashionable today to wear it. Turban around the head. Now, when one wears a turban around their head, what's at the center of the turban? Nothing. The top of the head is exposed. So the Ramban writes a double pella. Mitznefes of the Kohen Godel was Arucha Sheshis Rayama. It's very long, and Amma's a foot and a half, it was 16 Amma, who'd sonef ba'as rosh saviv saviv, and he would wrap it around his head, ve'em tzor rosh ha'mamala nishar megula, u'besoch ha'chalal yatzaka sashemen. Where was the oil poured for the anointing? Was in the middle, the turban was around the head, which meant the whole top of the head was bare. So according to the Ramban, the Kohen Gadol would wear the mitznefes, he was not wearing a yarmulke. He was Begile Rosh. The top of his head was bare. When he would enter on Yom Kippur to the Kodesh HaKadoshim, he was Begile Rosh. Could you imagine? Chazan gets up for Neila. Yes, God damn. And he's not wearing a yarmulke. So talus over his head, there's no hat on his head, there's no yarmulke on his head. Begile Rosh. Kohen Gadol, Yom Kippur, the Kodesh HaKadoshim, with the mitznefes, with the turban, is Begile Rosh, according to the Ramban. The Otzer Chachma Otzer Plos Torah says, "I asked Rav Chaim Kanievsky, according to the Ramban, Kohen Gadol's begile rosh and uncovered head. How could it be? How could it be? How could it be?" So his answer was, "Ain Kavanas Ramban Lomar Shai Nishab Mitznefes Makom Magula Mamish." It doesn't mean that it was exposed. Shai Korech Avnei Tzaviv Rosh Hakohen Hayamash Makom Shiurei. It meant it was wrapped around the head, even the top of the head. It was a tiny little area that was exposed to pour the oil. But really, the top of that also was covered because the Yafshar, it's pasnished. It's impossible to imagine. About Yeshlis Bonin, however, he says, there's more evidence that there is Gilei Rosh even in the Beis HaMikdash. Sharei Hayu Paisos Kol Yom Beis HaMikdash. There was a lottery every day in the temple to determine who did the Trimas Adeshim, who removed the ashes, the garbage of yesterday. And when they did it, a Kohen would omit the Beis HaMikdash, the Gilei Rosh, the Gemara Yimad Av says, the Kohen would stand in a circle and the one in charge would take off the turban, the Mitznefes, and that's how you'd know where to start when you went around. They stuck out the fingers and they did the count and you knew who won the lottery. So what do you see? One of them stood in the Mikdash. How? No yarmulke. The Gile Rosh. So he said, I asked the Munkacher Shlita. How could it be? Maybe this is evidence again about being in the base of Mikdash. The Gile Rosh. How could it be? And he goes on and on and on with pages here about what is really the halach of having to wear a yarmulke and can you ever 
not wear the yarmulke, and how could it be, and how can it be. And he quotes fascinating sources we don't have time for. He quotes one opinion, the Munkacher answered, and quotes sources, when do you need to walk with your head covered, or only make a bracha with your head covered, when you are otherwise distracted and could forget Hashem? The Gemara tells the story. Amsa, the, the, there was uh, Ima, there was a mother, one of the great rabbis who wouldn't let him walk out without his head covered, because as you walk and engage the world in the street, it's easy to forget there's a Hashem, and we wear something on top of our head, because a covering on the head is like clothing for the body. It's intellectual modesty. We have Yira, we have Ema, we remember that there's a Hashem. So when you're in a place or occupied with a practice which is itself holy, then you could be Begilei Rosh, because the place or the practice you're in would suffice. So the coin Gadol and Kadosh Hashem are the coin doing the doing the lottery. The Ramah writes in Ochoa Shabbos, also Likros Pesei for Torah Barosh Begula, you're not allowed to read from the Torah with your head uncovered. The Magen of Ram, it's talking about a katan. The Magen of Ram says, or you could explain that the Ramah, that with a gadol, you're not allowed to walk the Gile Rosh, but to stand or to sit, to read the Torah, you can. How could it be? Read the Torah? So the answer is, you're doing a religious and holy activity, you're not at the risk of forgetting Hashem in that moment, maybe you don't need to have your head covered. So is it really a halacha? Where does it really come from? He has a big discussion here about it. We've given Shiram on this in the past. We've given Shiram on this in the past. I could send you the... Uh, where, where's the origin of the word yarmulke? Where does it come from? So some suggest yarmulke, yarim, is is uh, a Turkish word. Yarim, kap, a hat, a small hat. Yiramalka, fear of the king. There's the etymology, etymology of the word yarmulke. Is a fascinating discussion. You would be shocked if you knew and saw the sources for we today have the practice of the minog. Svaradim, not as much, of wearing a yarmulke all the time, wherever, whatever we do. But it wasn't always the practice. It wasn't always the practice. And there even is a uh, opinion that uh, wouldn't wear a yarmulke even while sitting and learning. The Malamed Lahol says in Rav Hirsch's school in Germany, they would not wear a yarmulke for limudei chol in a first school, not a public school. They wore a yarmulke for limudei kodesh, not for limudei chol. They tell the story. I get in trouble for ending with this, but I might as well. You know that the Futner, the Rav, and the Rebbe, the Babich Rebbe, were all in university together in Berlin, in Germany. So they asked Rav Futner. They asked Rav Futner, Chassidim of the Rebbe, is it true our Rebbe is so great that even when he sat through classes, he wasn't really paying attention to the classes? He had a Gemara open, he was sitting and learning. He was learning even while he was in university. So he has a degree, and he passed all the tests, because he's so brilliant, but he was never really listening, because he was always learning. If you knew Rav Hutner's sharpness, Rav Hutner took to them and he said, that's impossible. So what do you mean impossible? Our Rebbe? He said, it's impossible, because your Rebbe would never learn without a yarmulke on his head. If you look at the original passport picture of the Rebbe, he's not wearing a yarmulke. Later, books and biographies of the Rebbe, it was superimposed on. But he's not, and that was the practice then to not always wear a yarmulke. So, anyway, there is an illusion, that's a plus a Torah quotes in our parsha of the mitznefes, maybe being Rebrosh Megula. Today the practice is to always have a head covered, and there's a lot more to say on the subject, but we are out of time. Now, again, in all seriousness, on your way out, we value, and we need your partnership. Please do what you can. It's really the appropriate and correct thing to do for you, but also it helps us, and we thank you. Stay happy, stay healthy, and stay... Happy, healthy, and holy.